Hello and welcome to the Belmont Journal, Belmont's very own source for hyperlocal news and community updates. I'm Mike Crowley, your host this week. We're fortunate to have Lisa Gibellario of the Belmont Wellness Coalition in the studio today to talk with us about the results from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey um, that are out recently. Welcome, Lisa. How, Lisa, how are you? Thank you. I'm well. It's great to be here. What is the, the, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey? I almost stumble every time I try to say that. <laughs> it is a mouthful. So the Youth Risk Behavior Survey is a comprehensive survey um, that was created by the Centers for Disease Control in 1990. Okay. Um, it is administered through many, many high schools across the country. Mm -hmm. um, it has been in Massachusetts for over a decade. Belmont uh, has done the Youth Risk Behavior Survey in the past, and uh, most recently was 2010, okay. 2012, and then this past spring. All right. And um, so what are some of the highlights from, from this most recent um, uh, this most recent uh, version of, of the survey? In Belmont, we surveyed our students from grade 7 through 12. Okay. Um, so we did that last spring, and they asked questions on many different substances, mm -hmm. um, including prescription drugs and um, uh, marijuana, vaping products, uh -huh. nicotine, alcohol. Um, but I would say what jumped out for me was mm -hmm. the fact that we do have um, students who are vaping mm -hmm. on a fairly regular basis. The numbers were in the about 25 to 27 percent of students reported having used e-cigarettes. The survey asked specifically about nicotine. Mm -hmm. However, we know that students could be vaping uh, marijuana THC products. So with the vaping, the, the, nico the risk for nicotine addiction, you know, has of course been a concern for many parents, but, but there, 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 there is this new issue as well with um, um, other health effects, in, including lung damage that we've right. seen nationwide. So some of the pods that people are obtaining um, have products in them that they did not believe were there. And the one product that's causing deterioration in the lungs is a vitamin E acetate. Uh -huh. So people are um, inhaling uh, something that should never be inhaled. And it's been found in nicotine pods as well as THC pods. What are some of the other things that, that, that we found with this, this version of the survey? Well, we found compared to um, other communities, so Belmont was part of a cohort of 12 communities, so we're able to compare our data with these other communities. And what we saw that Belmont um, you know, did better than the other communities mm -hmm. in some areas, but what concerned many of us who have been analyzing the data is some of the results around mental health. Our kids, our, our high school kids certainly reported feeling depressed, upwards of 25 to 27 percent. That should be concerning. Absolutely, because as we know, that impacts everything else. That impacts social situations. It impacts their desire to stay on the swim team or stay, you know, with a friend group, um, how interactive they are at home. So if they're feeling um, persistently sad or hopeless, it's going to impact all facets of their lives. And so that is concerning. And mm -hmm. those kids are more vulnerable to using substances as a way to self-medicate. So keeping an eye on the mental health status of our students is something that we at the Belmont Wellness Coalition are certainly committed to. So, so what can parents and the schools do to help? And, and, and perhaps that, that sort of ties into the work that you're doing with the Belmont Wellness Coalition. Yeah, so I think parents, um, one thing that we do know is that parent conversations make a meaningful difference. A lot of parents feel that this is something that they can't impact. You know, kids will be kids. I drank as a, you know, when I was in high school, and this is just an inevitable rite of passage. That may or may not be true, but what we do know to be true is that parents that are talking with their kids about substances, about mental health, have better outcomes. And mm -hmm. we don't just mean one conversation. We mean ongoing conversations. Um, the Belmont Wellness Coalition was involved in a campaign called Listen, Talk, Listen, which gave parents skills in how to have those conversations about substance use. Um, and as far as mental health, we just need to keep talking about it. We need to treat it the way we would treat chronic migraines or, um, you know, an a torn ligament in the knee. We need to destigmatize it and make our parents and students as comfortable talking about emotions as they are talking about, you know, a, a, a 
torn kneecap or whatever. Where, where can people find out more about these results from the Youth um, Risk Behavior Survey? So these results are on the school department's website. Okay. I think there's a section called For Parents. Also, for high school parents, the principal, Principal Taylor, sent out the report last week. I think it was Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So you can read the full report there. And for any parents who are concerned, um, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, or any member of the Belmont Wellness Coalition. We are planning parent workshops. We're going to keep the conversations going about substance use prevention and mental health awareness. These are the two things that we're very committed to addressing. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Lisa, and, and I know we'll be talking about this again. Great, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in the Belmontonian, and welcome back, Franklin Tucker, editor of the Belmontonian. So I think we're going to talk about the McLean development. That's right. It was, uh, it's the last great large developable, developable parcel in Belmont. Okay. Um, uh, McLean, this, this has to go back to uh, 1999 when the town and McLean had their deal to uh, parcel out the McLean uh, uh, property mm -hmm. uh, for uh, mostly housing. Uh, Northland uh, Residential, which is the uh, developer that built most of that. Every, every, if you ever go to there, you'll see the townhouses. They build all these beautiful little townhouses. Uh, Mitt Romney's we used to live there. So now there was a last parcel. It's called Zone 3. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, when Northland first came uh, back in uh, January and March, the town was not so happy to, <laughs> to see that they were just doing a cut and paste of what they had done before. Um, that's because um, uh, affordable housing is becoming a bigger issue, especially with the uh, housing trust really moving forward and, and, and pushing uh, an agenda of, of more exclusionary housing. What kind of housing are we talking about? We're not talking about single family homes, we're talking about um, uh, townhouses. Well, uh, to, well, to begin with, they, they wanted to do 120, 125 units of housing. Mm -hmm. um, about a, a little less than 100 in like uh, uh, condominiums. Okay. And then they were going to build about 34 uh, townhouses that were gonna be worth about $1.5 million each. Now, that just didn't go over <laughs> to anybody. So they've come back and, it's, mm -hmm. and they've really improved it in terms of affordability. All right. now, we're gonna, now they are proposing uh, 40 townhouses, which will be uh, smaller, mm -hmm. uh, less uh, square footage footage and about um, five or six of those will be affordable when I mean by affordable is 80 percent of the uh, of the going of the um, income in the uh, area so and that can come down to about sixty nine thousand dollars for a couple so that make that's that's very good and uh, now the uh, condominiums are going to be about a hundred and four uh, rental units Okay. And unlike the townhouses, they are not going to be age restrictive, and about 25% of those will be uh, affordable uh, in that 80% um, market. The project has a great deal of potential to really add to the amount of affordable housing that we have here in Belmar. That's right, it's, and, and, it's, and it's also a good mix because not only are they doing affordability, but it's rentals. Uh -huh. And rentals, uh, they're not as expensive as condominiums. You can get somebody who can come in for three years. Maybe you can, have, maybe you can look at uh, students at, at, you know, or, or faculty at, at Harvard or in any of the medical uh, facilities here. So it is a great mix. Um, so what is the process from here on out? So the planning board just met. That's right. Planning board met. Uh, it was an informal meeting, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, Northland has say, has stated this is the they're basically in the in the very beginning, and uh, they're trying to tr do as much as they can. And then, and, and even the CEO said there there are going to be times when we say no to things. Okay. But right now it's it, it has received uh, enthusiastic support from the housing campaigners. Is there a process? for the community be, to be providing input as this goes forward? I mean, so, so for example, have, have any formal approvals been given um, to a, a you know, quote unquote green light to begin the actual development? It will be coming to the planning board who will, and, uh, and it will go also to the town meeting in the spring okay. uh, because it will have to change its zoning um, of the bylaws. So that will need, mean a two thirds vote. Okay. But right now, uh, it doesn't seem like there's many obstacles in its way. So we look forward to hearing more and um, we'll talk to you next time, Franklin. Thank you very much. Guarino's Barbershop has been in business for in Belmont for over 106 years. 
serving generations from Belmont and other nearby communities. The history of the barbershop is John Pino started in 1913 and he died in 1948, followed by John O'Terry, which John O'Terry was the barbershop who was located in Belmont Center, where Belmont Saving is right now. We've been in this building since 1968, and we're still here, God willing, to stay here for a few more years of hope. When you're young, either you train or you go to school. But go to school was hard for me because the teachers of those days, they whack you. And I don't like to get whack, so my father said, either you go and learn a trade or you go to school. So I'd rather have a trade than go to school. I have an album, I keep it for records, all the first haircuts. Every kid is different. It's some they will, the first time they come in and they say, oh, I can talk, all of a sudden they say, Frank, 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 lollipop, Frank, gumball. You know, it's, it's a lot of, I enjoy more the little ones than uh, growing up because I have a more, I joke with them and say, shaving a haircut. The kids say, what? I don't have no whiskers. So it's a little fun. Everybody knew Frank under the bank because it was another Frank in Cushion Square. I have one time I was to awake and I saw an old customer. I say, I know the father. The person I was with, I say, how you know the person you never met him? And I, when he pays respect, then he went on the back and went to say, hey, Joe, how are you? They say, Frank under the bank, how are you? The new style now is like uh, unbelievable. It's like you put a ball over their head and they cut around. And that is the new style. But if you look at some of those haircuts, it seems like they put their fingers on the left of the socks and their hair sticking up. But that's the new style. I don't know. Four or five years, I wouldn't be around. But four or five years from now, change again. I would say to the community, thank you very much for keeping me in business. It's so long and faithful customers. Some of them come in for many, many years and enjoy every minute of their company. Welcome to this week in the Citizen Herald and welcome back Joanna Juvelis, who you, you are the senior multimedia journalist with the Citizen Herald. We're gonna talk about the town budget. Yes. So there was a presentation on November 18th that the town administrator gave for the about the FY21 operating budget. Now it is very early in the game, right. but they want to start talking about it because what they're doing is they're making changes so that they don't have to have an override for FY21, but there will have to be an override for, for FY22. There's that, no doubt about that, it. That's right. They're they're pushing off. They're pushing off. Um, a potential spring override right. um, into, into the fall. Yes, um, and it would be on the November 2020 presidential uh, election day, right? And, and the hope is that there will be higher turnout and and, and a greater chance of success. But what are some right. of the things that are that that are happening okay. that that are resulting in a much tighter budget for? Definitely a tighter budget. There is an estimated um, structural deficit for FY21 of five to six million dollars. So they're, de they're decreasing expenditures by 1.7% over mm -hmm. FY20. And the way they're doing that is they're basically level funding all the departments. So there won't be raises necessarily for anybody in the town. Um, they changed the health plan. That's a big thing. The, mm -hmm. the employee's health plan is now different and that will save the town a considerable amount of money. Um, they're deferring minor capital and public safe, um, capital and public safety facilities and libraries. So for instance, if there's something that needs to be fixed that can wait in any of those facilities, or there's equipment that public safety needs that can wait, they're going to put it off for a year. Now, now Anne Marie Mahoney and Pat Bruce at that meeting raised some questions about Definitely that. Definitely concerns because they said if you don't keep up with these maintenance costs, some of these maintenance costs, it's going to bite you later. It's going to come back to bite you later. It's going to end up costing you more later. 
The, the concern being that perhaps we dig a bigger hole. But the question is, as I asked Anne Marie, so what's the other solution if, if you don't do this? What, what would the solution be? And she, she couldn't answer that. She's like, I just, I just wish it didn't have to affect you know, these departments because that always seems to be the solution. It always seems to go back to capital. And um, I mean, the only other solution would be personnel cuts and they're trying to avoid that. That's right. So, so um, what 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 are some of the, so what are some of the ways in which you know this is going to potentially affect town departments? I mean, including well, including the schools. Well, yes, yeah, Superintendent John Phelan, he said that he's going to try to um, not spend. Is it right? Not spend the one point seven million that he gets from the state for special ed. Funding. So, so he has a he has a reserve. The state, right. the state, the state guidelines right. request that communities build up a reserve of so one year. So he's going to try to give that back to the town. In effect, by spending it down, and then the town contributes right. less to the school budget. But I guess the concern is, what if what if he needs it? What if there are some kids that you know? That, that's right. Uh, a special education, it's exactly. a volat volatile line it's in the budget. It's very volatile. And the other thing that they're not sure about is what the Minuteman expense will be. Um, they are going to try to increase. It, it is worth noting that Patrice has set aside an extra half a million. Interesting, uh, for, right? For for um, just expected in increased enrollment, as well as the fact that as a non-member, we fall mm -hmm. off the the, the four-year rolling average that was part of the member assessment. Right. But again, there are a lot of unknowns, and there's a lot of work to be done between now and F. Um, the November 2020 election. There's a lot of work to be done that the financial task force too is going That's to right. be doing. And they're, they're also trying to see if Belmont Light can increase revenue and they're using the Water Enterprise Fund to offset um, costs for water and IT. Um, and they're going to use $1.4 million of free cash. These are all the, right. the things that they're going to be doing. So this is a continuing story and, it is. and, and we'll be Still talking very more early about in the it. Game. Yeah, and, uh, but a lot of people aren't happy about it, especially you know just town departments. Well, thank you very much, Joanna, and and we will be talking about this again. Yes. The Dana Farber Cancer Institute has the only mobile mammography program in Massachusetts, and it recently visited Belmont. Joanna Jubilus gives us a tour. Welcome to. Dana Farber's mammography van. Uh, we just would like for you to see the inside of the van. It really is a, a mobile clinic, so we have all of the components of what you would uh, see if, if you went to the Dana Farber main campus. So as soon as you walk in, you would be greeted here and you would sit down with our program coordinator. Um, who would continue or would complete the registration process, get any necessary signatures, uh, and make sure that you are in fact eligible to be screened today. And over here, I'll just point, we have our waiting area. Uh, so if we do have a, a couple of patients waiting to be screened, we have a comfortable space for them to wait. And so once a woman is checked in, uh, at this point she would come over here uh, to one of our two changing rooms. And if you want to Come and take a peek in here. The woman is privately able to change. We have robes in here for her. Not a lot of space, but it's exactly you know the amount of space you need to get changed, take off any deodorant, and then at that point, um, the patient would go through this door into the exam room for her mammogram. Hi, I'm Lauren Benieri. I'm one of the technologists at work at Dana Farber Mammography. We're gonna take you through to the room. So we use the GE machine right now on the van. the control panel. What happens over there? Okay, once we have the patient in position, it's the control panel to go ahead and set the technique, or the technique is set, I should say, and just whatever view we're doing, whether it's the CC or the MLO views. Once the patient is done, we send the images from this machine to what we call the Hermes, to the laptop Hermes. All them, and that's the piece of uh, equipment that goes back to Dana-Farber and we'll upload them onto the system back at Dana-Farber. So for the past uh, several years we've been averaging around 2,000 patients a year. Yeah. Oh, I think it's a wonderful program. It gets out to service to areas where we wouldn't have people coming into Dana-Farber or women potentially not getting mammograms because it's not convenient. And that's pretty much the feedback we get from people. 
when they come on. They're very appreciative that we come to the sites. It makes it a lot easier for them. And now it's time for Sports and Chet's Scoreboard. This past Tuesday evening, student athletes, parents, friends, and coaches gathered at Belmont High School to recognize the achievements of the fall teams. It is the ceremony where the first-time varsity letter winners are presented with their varsity jackets that are provided by the Belmont Boosters. Athletic Director Jim Davis hosted the event and had an important and significant announcement. We're very fortunate this fall that all of our fall teams qualify for postseason play. All of our teams. That's a testament to the hard work of our student athletes and our coaches and the support from you as parents and the community. It's, it's, a, it's an exciting time when we get to the tournament. It's been a, a fun ride uh, for, for everybody, so thank you. Jim presented to the captain of the golf team the 2019 Liberty Division Championship banner. On Saturday, November 16, the Marauder cheerleading team also captured a Liberty Division Championship. Jim presented the four co-captains of the cheerleading squad with their banner on Tuesday night. Turning to football, the Marauders defeated Beverly last weekend, 24-21, and will be taking on the Watertown Raiders at Victory Field in Watertown on Thanksgiving Day at 10.15 a.m. Happy Thanksgiving. Think about it, are Belmont Public Schools art teachers or artists themselves? Well, of course they are. And now you have an opportunity to admire some of their work at the Belmont Gallery of Art's new exhibit called Elemental, the Building Blocks of Art. This is our new exhibit um, called Elemental, uh, the Building Blocks of Art. It features work by over 50 local and regional artists who interpreted what it means to create art using the basic elements of art. Shape, color, line, form, value, space. space. And it's a very eclectic show. No two pieces um, are alike. We have several Belmont art teachers featured in the exhibit. And we do want to mention um, Burbank art teacher Nicole Pond who was instrumental in having this show come together. We had visited her last fall at her classroom at the Burbank School. Um, we noticed that she had signs. She had wonderful posters detailing things like the elements of art. And mm -hmm. I and thought it was yeah. wonderful because I've never had a teacher who had these things where I was like, oh, that's, that's a great way of breaking down art. This is a great way to look at it. And we realized, talking with Nicole, that um, the foundation that she provides even young school-aged children, it's really the same foundation that adult artists also use. I think we should maybe mention the other art teachers who are in the show. Mark Malowski, who teaches the AP art um, classes at the high school, is in the show. Andrew Roy, who's a photography teacher at the high school, he's also in the show. Kathy Larkin, who's actually newly retired, but she has work in the show. She was the high school ceramics teacher and Ashley um, Crusco um, is also in the show. She's an elementary school art teacher. And Megan Remick, um, who teaches at the high school, is also represented in the show. So I think that Adine and I were pleased that we had a number of um, teachers in the show as well, again, because to show that they also sort of practice what they preach in a sense, that they, you know, they, they show how they incorporate these these elements of art into their own um, creations. And it's a great example for the kids to see that it's not just, you know, Mrs. Remick doesn't just come in and teach them and then she goes home and she thinks how to teach them the next day. She actually has her own vision and <laughs> she's gonna pursue it. And that, you know, maybe somewhere in their brains they feel like, I could do that too. You know, it may not earn a lot of money being an artist, but she could also teach. Yes, yes, yeah. And now it's time for our community calendar with Jane Peters. Hi, I'm Jane and this is your community calendar for next week. 
As the weather rapidly changes to winter, the Beach Street Center and Fire Department want you to be pre-prepared for weather-related emergencies. Assistant Fire Chief Wayne Haley will be visiting the center to discuss BEMA, the Belmont Emergency Management Agency, who works with state, local, and federal agencies to ensure that Belmont is prepared to respond to any situation. Bring your questions to this meeting on Tuesday, November 26th at 1.15. Stitchers can drop in with their latest crafting venture at the Belmont Books Cafe on Sunday from 4 to 5 for Stitched Lines, a new group for new and experienced sewers, knitters, embroiderers, and other fiber arts artists. These sessions will continue every Sunday from 4 to 5 p.m. at the Black Bear Cafe. The BHS PTO presents a screening of the film Screenagers Next Chapter, Uncovering Skills for Stress Resilience on Tuesday, December 3rd at 7 in the BHS Auditorium. The film examines the science behind the emotional challenges of tweens and teens with the interplay of social media, sleep, and external pressures. A Q&A session with Belmont school staff will follow the film. The Belmont Youth Commission presents Pizza with Cops and Canine at the Belmont Public Library on Friday, December 6th at 3.30. Parents and kids can enjoy pizza with local police officers, meet one of the department's canine officers, and ask questions. The Belmont Garden Club presents a holiday green sale with centerpieces, mini trees, wreaths, and other home decor for the holidays made by club members. Proceeds from the sales benefit the Garden Club for scholarships and community plantings. The sale takes place on Saturday, December 7th from 10 a.m. to 2. Johnny Kringle and the Wonderland Band's drummer Tom Maher has been delivering toys to the Children's Hospital for over 10 years. Bring a new and unwrapped toy to the First Church in Belmont on Saturday, December 7th for a holiday rock concert with the band from 1 to 2. Following the concert, the toys will be packed up and delivered to the hospital for the holidays. Shop for a cause at the First Church You Use Social Action Holiday Gift Fair on Sunday, December 8th from 10 a.m. to 2. An array of products from local and international artisans will be on display for sale, from clothing and accessories to food and photography. Benefits from the sale will benefit an array of causes. And that's all for the next two weeks. We hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. If you have an event that you'd like to share with Belmont Journal, you can send your event info to jane at belmontmedia.org. We finish our show with a programming update for your Belmont Media Center channels. Well, that's all for this week. I'm Mike Crowley. This is the Belmont Journal, and we'll see you next time.